Now back to the show. This is You and the Law with Sterling Fox on AM650. Delighted to have David Hobbs and Ian Girodi from Hobbs Girodi in studio for this edition of You and the Law, in which we're looking at the category of wills variation. And, uh, well, uh, the, our uh, our guests uh, specialize in estate litigation. And during the break, uh, Ian, you were talking about the most common groups of combatants uh, seeking to resolve uh, the outcome of a will. And they are, generally speaking, the adult children of the deceased versus the most recent spouse of the deceased who is not likely to be any relation to the children other than by marriage, correct? Correct. That's, uh, we call them blended marriage cases. Okay. And um, it's uh, probably half of the cases we see involve that scenario. And what's, what's the usual uh, uh, gripe? Is that the adult children feel that they've been uh, 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 undercut by more money going to the new spouse than the, they feel she deserves? Is that? It's, it's funny. I, you know, I, I would say it's about 50-50 there. We see we have uh, second or third spouses coming in saying, you know, my husband of 30 years left everything to his three adult children. Right, right. Uh, from his prior marriage. Um, and we have um, the children coming in saying, you know, Dad left everything to this uh, woman that he married five years ago and cut us out of his million dollar or two million dollar estate. Right. One of the um, interesting dynamics, Sterling, is that the the deceased, the will maker, may not want to leave the estate or a large chunk of it to his third wife or fourth wife. Mm-hmm. Not so much because he begrudges her, but because he doesn't want her children to receive his estate. Ah, okay. And 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 his children on his side of the family also don't like that idea that the wealth that their family built up, um, their father, their mother, it may have been the mother, she may have passed away, the father may be there now, and now they're looking at this this optic of of a large part of the estate going to a recent spouse and from her to child to her children and it's like a piece of the family has just made its way off into the sunset and uh, that dynamic is uh, drives people's thinking so what do you two do when you have one or the other and clearly you have both uh, groups on, on that side of the dispute coming to see you is the is the object of the exercise for legal professionals like yourselves to make everybody happy to get half of the estate to the the new spouse the other half to the children or is your job just to represent your clients and get as much for them and uh, heck with the other players in the game well i think one of the benchmarks that that we use and i think all lawyers do is is one of the hypotheticals is what if we do end up in court what will the facts be and what will the law be and what will the judge do and what will that cost and how long will it take and so on and so forth because, and this, this would be uppermost in your consideration because you go to court and frequently too well we do and but I, I i guess i'm simply saying that's one benchmark against one against which you can measure okay any other possible outcome and uh, lawyers have a famous expression that a bad settlement is better than a good day in court mm-hmm. um and uh, there's some truth to that that expression, um, but certainly that's one outcome the client might get. They might get their day in court. The judge may decide what's going to happen, and and they'll get there eventually at at, at whatever stress and time and so on. And so you look at that and you say, well, how how is that going to play out? And then you're looking at other alternatives to see whether they're a better choice. Ian, uh, as the dollar <laughs> figure value of the estate increases. Does the intensity of the emotions involved by the parties, the contestants in all of this, does that increase as well? Um, not necessarily. Um, what the, the importance of the size of the estate really in, in what we do, because people can be equally unhappy of being left out of a quarter million dollar estate as as under a $5 million estate, because that's what they kind of grew up with. Sure. You know, they, sure. they have different yeah. levels of expectation. But, um, you know, we, we talked about these legal and moral obligations owed to different claimants. Yes. When you have a small estate, um, the legal obligations are going to loom large in any, uh, either under the will or in any variation of that will. You know, so if it's a, a small estate, the first thing you look at is, uh, it, uh, 
especially if it's a long-standing spouse, you know, that spouse has to be taken care of before mm-hmm. we even think about adult independent children. And in fact, there may be nothing for an, an adult independent child with a small estate. Um, there's uh, some case law that uh, uh, fairly recently, the last few years, which makes it clear that where you're dealing with a substantial estate, however, um, there's enough to satisfy the legal and the moral obligations to all sure. concerned. Right. So there's enough to go around and everybody should come away with something right. and, and some measure of, of comfort, David, because of that. And if there's a, a significant amount of money to begin with, right? Well, an important case that, that one could read about is uh, the, the Coley Hall estate. I don't know if you knew Coley Hall or, or had any dealings with him, but he, he had a relationship late in life and had a large estate and uh, and had unhappy adult children that were uh, sharing with with the uh, his uh, spouse and a common law spouse and mm-hmm. and that resulted in a lot of litigation that ended up making a lot of law in British Columbia about the fight between adult children and and uh, and uh, second third marriage spouses and I suppose the message that comes from it is that the spouses common law spouses have shall we say a stronger position in the law than they did prior to that decision. And that's so. partly you know, what you were talking about earlier in terms of the law, and, and it's it's 2013, and British Columbia law reflects the fact that it's 2013, and, and we live in changing times, and certain societal values are a, a work in progress, evolving. Absolutely, and um, uh, we, we uh, during our last session, we talked about a very important case that came out of East Vancouver that went to the Supreme Court of Canada about 20 years ago. And uh, that's the case that, that uh, it leads us to this idea of legal and moral obligations. It's also the case that tells us that those legal and moral obligations are, are to be seen through the prism of contemporary societal standards. Exactly, right. So, so uh, it's actually um, uh, an, an interesting aspect of law that it's, it, it evolves um, very gradually um, by slight tweaking of cases of decisions made and now we have actually a, uh, an aspect of the test where um, s- contemporary societal standards and, and values will will be part of that evolution. Interesting stuff. So basically though, if uh, I guess, and it's not going to help your business at all, but having a will in your life would be a great thing to, to have. Don't you think, gentlemen, that uh, even though it may be contested and you may be involved in that part of it, geez, get a will organized at very, very least, right? You should have a will, Sterling. I think that'd be a great place to start. <laughs> and then uh, eventually uh, you may have to uh, t- uh, avail yourself of the services of Hobbs Girodi in Vancouver. And if you do, I assure you, you will be in excellent hands. David and Ian, thanks very much for coming by. Great to have you on this episode of You and the Law. Thanks, Sterling. Thanks for having us, Sterling. 